Hello, hello. Hel hello, everyone. Obviously, at this early hour of the day, the people are still a little bit lost in this building. <laughs> so uh, Tanya and I, we just decided we start a session. There are enough people in the room, and I would call all the ones who are involved from the NRI side, from the national and regional IGFs, to come to the stage if they have been participating. If not, if no one is in the room, then Tanya will freestyle a little bit with you. <laughs> so are, are there any speakers in this room? No. Wow. So one moment then. I guess that people were still queuing outside, those who didn't have their badges, uh, who didn't pick up their badges yesterday or the day before yesterday. I want to ask you, because I mean, I cannot be the only speaker, right? Are there people who are involved in your regional or national initiatives on the internet governance? Any of you? I see a couple of hands. And so I see a couple of hands from Europe. So um, for anyone who just came here, if there are any speakers, please, please come on stage. Um, and I, I see that two people who raised their hands were actually involved in what I was going to speak about, about European initiatives on cybersecurity. Um, so I don't know, I, I, guess, I guess actually um, uh, that you are all here to, to hear about different cybersecurity efforts. And I believe that this session was going to be structured like this, like we first were going to provide input on what was going on, um, on different cybersecurity discussions and contexts, like for example, protection of vulnerable targets, minors, and then moving to the collaborative approaches to cybersecurity. But since we have no speakers, I'm going to change it. I mean, I'm free to, right? Um, I come to support you. Oh, super. So I guess, I, I guess I'm going to make a caveat here. Oh, there is one more speaker. We decided to freestyle. Uh, so I'm, then I'm, I'm going to moderate a bit and I'm going to follow the structure of the session I was provided. And I have to admit that I didn't like the structure at all. Because from the European point of view, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we do not consider cybersecurity at the Eurodig, I will start with the meta level. We do separate cybersecurity and safety of children. So the discussion was, support, was supposed to start with the idea of how in cybersecurity we are approaching protection of vulnerable targets, protection of children online, protection of youth online. And at Eurodig, I'm going to speak from Eurodig, we have no approach to this. We are not approaching this issue from the cybersecurity perspective. Cybersecurity for us is protection of the um, critical infrastructure, it's norm making, it's collaborative approaches to secure networks, and we treat child protection as a safe internet. Protection of vulnerable targets, awareness, capacity building, so that child online protection is never under the umbrella of cybersecurity because we believe that the tools for child protection and for cybersecurity and policies and actors involved are very different and we have to approach these issues from different perspectives. And I'm going to pass the, 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 the ball here to Andrea, Adrian. Who, uh, Adrian, who is um, representing Swiss IGF. So how do you approach this issue? Yes, uh, hello everyone, I'm Adrian Koster. I work with the Swiss governmental CERT. So uh, we try to improve cybersecurity uh, in Switzerland. Uh, from the uh, basic cyber hygiene point of view, because we are tasked with the protection of critical infrastructure, and we believe that uh, uh, the, the more secure uh, uh, national or the global network is, the less threats are there for critical infrastructure, so that uh, you will uh, be able to keep on uh, having your power, uh, having your telecommunications and all the other services uh, you, uh, you need. And we also uh, try to foster uh, cooperation, collaboration amongst all stakeholders. But uh, especially we see that uh, there is some responsibility with all the intermediaries because uh, um, between me and Tatiana, when we uh, communicate over the internet or we interact, there, is, uh, there are several players in between, 
and uh, they are usually uh, tasked with just uh, transmitting everything that comes into their networks and giving it out uh, as it is. And um, on a technical layer, uh, um, an ISP, uh, an access provider, he might find out that my computer is infected. So uh, there's one um, perspective or one argument that uh, like he says, well, I ha I'm required by law to transmit whatever comes out of this connection and pass it on. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, as he can detect that I'm infected, I would really like to get notified about this. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to pass to Yon Chan Cho. Do I say your name correctly? Uh, from Korean IGF. Okay, hi, my name is Yun Chang Choi. I am a representative of uh, KL IGF. Okay, I'm very pleased to hear uh, to discuss about cybersecurity uh, relating to the internet freedom. As you know, South Korea is really uh, has been facing some kind of threat from uh, North Korea or around the super big power around the Korean Peninsula, as you know. And then uh, I try to divide, uh, I try to explain uh, with the three fronts. First is that the industry really uh, has been attacked by DDoS or some kind of the, uh, crypto attack. Some uh, crypto, crypto ransom is really, really highly profiling problem in South Korea because uh, uh, some ISP or internet domain provider has been locked up because of uh, uh, crypto ransom spyware. And then uh, more than 1,000, more than, more than less than 1,000 sometime has been attacked by the kind of the new emerging threat of the cyber attack. That's a problem. And then including uh, many uh, industry, including ISPs, uh, asking government to do something. But the tension has been arising, kind of what? Because uh, when government do do something for to against the uh, threat of the cyber attack, they need some regulation or authority and, and then much more power. The problem is that ISP just reluctant to provide that kind of the cooperation or some kind of the uh, information sharing problem. That's the uh, tension. It's, uh, that's the first chapter of my idea. The second one is that uh, government authority has been uh, divided by several uh, agencies. Uh, in European style, there's a some kind of ANISA, European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. I really inspired that ANISA, and they uh, has a really comprehensive and inclusive approach about the cybersecurity problem. The South Korea is uh, uh, there are much more uh, institutions than the authorities, especially. Uh, in South Korea's case, uh, uh, the threat of the North Korea is that uh, some government national security agency has a lot much power about the cybersecurity. But personally, I do not know how much they about understanding technical problem of the cybersecurity. That's uh, my personal opinion, not official. And then uh, I think uh, South Korea really uh, will will be of embracing some kind of the inclusive and the much more comprehensive approach about the to against the threat of the cybersecurity problem. The third one is that I believe, uh, okay, civil society. Civil society members uh, really uh, totally understood what kind of problem and what kind of damage they have from the cybersecurity. But the problem is that they really uh, try to protect some privacy <laughs> and the international internet freedom. And several years ago, South Korean constitutional court just struck down the pro uh, regulation of the about Internet Identification Registration Act because uh, it undermines some anonymity of the internet privacy, internet uh, sp speech or privacy. And that's why S Supreme, uh, South Korean Constitutional Court struck down that regulation. To, and then by the uh, side of the effect of the, the decision, the problem is that anyone, even from the outside of the country, anyone can try, anyone can just disseminate a lot of the false or fake news or some kind of the, some blame defamation everywhere. And then sometimes uh, I believe face, fake news is much more dangerous than something cyber attack. In case of the, you, you already heard about some kind of Russian case. 
how Russians attack other influence to their U.S. presidential election. They never demolish some kind of facility, or they never kill people, but they just just slightly change, slightly uh, slightly influence some kind of people's idea, perception. We can call it a public opinion. And then when it comes to public opinion, have, has been shaped or manipulated by people. I think it's a much more dangerous attack than cyber attack because it's not physical damage, but uh, sometimes it's kind of they're, uh, undermining people's trust. And then and voters cannot vote for their people who they like. That's a problem. And then I, uh, I'm, I'm here to uh, share the information about South Korea, and then I want to hear the other country from the United States. Okay, question. Oh, no. Okay, she has no idea. No. Okay. Uh, uh, can so I? Okay, you moderate. Okay. Uh, so yes, um, I, I have a few points to sum up for further discussion. First of all, I saw that two of the speakers touched the role of the ISPs and regulation, and how much ISPs are actually involved in prevention and cyber attacks. And I would also like to uh, put it further for discussion the uh, the question are fake news cybersecurity, and I'm going to address this from the European perspective, but before I move there, we have two more uh, representatives from regional initiatives. Michael Watert is working for the Association of the ISPs, and Michael, if you can tell us briefly, what is your take, uptake on the, on the um, ISPs responsibilities, how much involved they are? Um, I'm not going to take a, a talk about um, fake news, because uh, I believe fake Oh, you are going to talk about fake news, but just wrote, no, not right now. <laughs> no, yeah, not right now. Uh, because I believe uh, fake news existed since ages, centuries already. Um, not in the internet, but elsewhere. Now, um, from the ISP uh, or from the industry perspective, we had uh, some, some years ago, and I explained this um, or already in many other countries, we had a, a nice private-public partnership supported by uh, German government um, uh, with uh, 2 million euros um, to set up a project um, uh, targeting two groups. One is small businesses and one is private individuals. And the one was about, uh, was called, the project was called Bot Free uh, and it was against uh, <coughs> bots and in infections of uh, PCs from private individuals, and this was done together with um, the um, virus uh, software industry and together with the press who distributed um, uh, CD-ROMs and, and, and with uh, um, <coughs> uh, anti antivirus software. And uh, um, it was so successful that uh, when we started, uh, Germany was somewhere on uh, on ranking on number 18 in the, uh, <coughs> or uh, if I reverse it, uh, number two or number three uh, uh, from distributing, uh, the world most distributing uh, um <coughs> malware uh, because people had old PCs and stuff like that. And uh, we, went uh, <coughs> up to place uh, to, to ranking number 18 after one year um, just by distributing um, the, the software and helping the people uh, to get uh, rid of their uh, infected computers. Um, the way we, we did this was also agreed with the um, data protection uh, authorities um, <coughs> so there were no one uh, going directly into the computer of a private individual, but they t told them what to do. Um, uh, and and uh, they, they did it with a call, we did it with a call center on one side, but also with uh, uh, web pages uh, to help them. The other um, uh, project was for home pages from uh, very small businesses. They, they quite often know someone who can set up a home page for their business for a little money, maybe the son who just started uh, computer science uh, studies or so something like that. And um, we offered a test to, to see if there, are, uh, if there is uh, old software, outdated software used, uh, which makes it easy for uh, 
uh, getting infected for, uh, with uh, drive-by uh, uh, infection and, and any other mail, um, malware when someone visits their, their website. So what we, the way we did it was we uh, got the agreement from the small business to copy the whole stuff down and then it was tested offline uh, in, a, <coughs> in a lab and uh, the result was reported back. Um, that was the only way we thought, um, which is feasible. We needed the, um, <coughs> the agreement of the owner, of course, um, uh, from, um, to, to, to copy the stuff down, um, to be compliant with uh, data protection rules and, 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 and business rules. And this is, the second uh, uh, project was the problem on how to get to the small businesses like painters or, or something like that. Um, uh, and and that, uh, that was the biggest problem and we still didn't achieve the numbers we had with the uh, bot free um, <coughs> uh, project. We both put together these projects to handle it on a European scale and um, uh, both projects were at least successful and in, in Europe as well and was funded by the European uh, <coughs> Commission as a separate European project, um, <coughs> which you can find if you look at the, in the website for BotFree, you, you may find uh, uh, links uh, uh, to, to these two projects. That's what we did from the uh, German ISP industry. Um <coughs> Uh, uh, for cybersecurity, but uh, my personal view is that the soft and, and hardware industry, uh, it's uh, mostly their job to do what already can be done technically and using more encryption, even if governments doesn't want it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we have Nata from Georgian government. And Nata, if you can tell us what are the Georgian discussion on the Georgian national level about cybersecurity, role of the ISPs, role of the governments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I represent Ministry of Justice, Data Exchange Agency. Maybe all of you have heard about Georgia more for its wine and food and good culture, but less about cybersecurity. But actually, uh, Georgia is uh, in top 10 most committed countries for cybersecurity, based on, on uh, ITU Global Cybersecurity Index. And actually, we are second in Europe after Estonia and in line with France. So well, why Georgian government paid more attention of cybersecurity? The simple, uh, the simple reply is that in 2008, we had a big cyber attack on Georgian cyberspace, on our critical infrastructure, and then it was the crucial point that uh, government paid a lot of attention. We created agencies, institutional frameworks, legal frameworks, uh, strategies that were just targeted on uh, developing of Georgian cybersecurity. Uh, on our way to developing a, a cyber ecosystem, we made many, many of mistakes. Uh, one of them was this top-down approach and having less attention coming from private sector and involvement of private sector in decision and policy making process, uh, reinvention of the wheels and nowadays we are on this good path that we have the association agreement with EU and generally Georgia is on the way of putting cybersecurity legal regimes on our um, legal framework and making um, harmonization of uh, EU acquis in Georgian uh, system. Uh, from next year, we are in the process of implementing the NIST directive um, so that we will have a mandatory requirements for critical infrastructures in um, and their incident handling and information sharing um, platforms with Georgian CERT community. Uh, at the same time, uh, what was a uh, new uh, development is that in our constitution, we put that uh, ensuring of cyber security should not infringe human rights, so that access to internet and usage of internet should be in compliance with the privacy and other human rights, uh, personal data protection, and so on and so on. So it is constitutionally guaranteed within our legal system. 
What is more also important is that um, we are in the process of developing regional partnerships for the insurance of protection of critical infrastructure. With the so Caucasus and Black Sea region and within the involvement of uh, Eastern European uh, partner countries, Georgia is leading the effort of ensuring a cybersecurity protection of commonly used critical infrastructures. This is a really very interesting project and uh, so that all our regional countries would put efforts in ensuring cybersecurity of commonly used critical infrastructures in the region. Uh, we are in the process of having a new cybersecurity strategy with the involvement of private sector, and the strategy is firstly ever uh, designed with the involvement of um, academia, with the involvement of internet service providers and other private sector representatives, and it will be enacted next year with the three years action plan in the process. We will be amending uh, legislations and legal regimes and do a lot of emphasis on awareness and capacity building, which, which is uh, a crucial point for Georgia. This is in short. Thank you very much all. And from my notes, now I'm wearing my moderator hat. I mean, basically for those who just arrived, I'm wearing two hats. One of them is moderator hat and another one is um, the representative of the European Dialogue on the Internet Governance. So I make an overview of the debates which exist on the European level. Um, I've heard the words fake news several times and I'm going to throw this ball just for a very short discussion because, and now my head of the European Dialogue of the Internet Governance, so the Eurodig, we do not believe that fake news is a cybersecurity threat. We treat fake news under the track of uh, media law, sometimes of the human rights, so how do you actually fight illegal content and what is illegal, you know, an age of digital disease, of ubiquitous information. And I can say that on the European level what I see in connection to fake news and I would really like to hear from Korea maybe and from Michael Rothert because Germany has this European network or sorry German network enforcement law about fighting and removing illegal content so my first question would be cyber is, is it a cyber security threat my another hat answer no and secondly how do you see this trend influencing security jurisdiction and anything related to crime, because in Europe what I see uh, is this debate about changing the concept of intermediary liability. So just to be covered here, Europe had an e-commerce directive in 2000, which proclaimed that intermediaries, ISPs, platforms, and whoever you might imagine, uh, have no liability for the content unless they are notified, first of all. And secondly, um, they do not have obligation to monitor the content prior actively. What is going on in Europe now with relation to terrorism content and fake news is introduction of the new concept of intermediary or platform responsibility. So instead of changing the concept of liability, notice and take down, on the European level debate creates new narrative that there is responsibility of the platforms and they indeed have to monitor the content. And I see it as a next trend. And I see that, for example, in Germany, there is already a network enforcement law and some proactive content monitoring is already involved. And um, so shall we start with, uh, first of all, um, Korean IGF, do you believe that um, cyber security includes fake news and if it is, does it, uh, how should it be handled? Should be the proactive content monitoring? So what your national initiative think about this? Okay, uh, thanks for their asking for that. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, some kind of their, uh, intermediary liability, as uh, may, maybe consists of some monitoring obligation, and then uh, and then sometimes they struck down the, the illegal contents or some kind of a, some very critical threat for, from some anonymous where. But in South Korea, uh, there is no uh, there is only uh, the law who, uh, which she just uh, obligate ISP about. The, that kind of the obligation when only when it is a, uh, a critical infrastructure. That is, uh, in short, in South Korea has a law, 
uh, about the cybersecurity protection in critical infrastructure, but not whole things. Because, uh, because when law enable some authority or ISP to do something or whole at work, that means it's a close monitoring of the everything. I believe this kind of the, uh, that's the point the civil society members really are against that. This is, I realize that exactly the same thing happened all over the world. And then, but uh, I can say, that I can specify some, uh, some country name, but some authority and country, just they do, they do monitor everything and then they, they quickly struck down the illegal content, I believe. And then, uh, the, I personally believe the intermediary liability is not put to the solution because uh, they uh, had a lot of burden about that kind of things. And then sometimes ISP has not much technical solution against some new emerging technological threat, I believe. That's a problem. And then I suggest a new solution is uh, information sharing. Cybersecurity threat information sharing is very important. And I believe it's the, uh, one of the policy making process which uh, private sectors and civil society and the public sector get together. I believe it's a multi-stakeholder model of, of the cybersecurity uh, so, uh, protection, cybersecurity problem solution, I believe. But, but still, not many countries has, has an ideal solution about how can they realize or materialize their uh, cybersecurity threat information sharing. Uh, for example, cybersecurity attack has happened to the, some kind of very big uh, IT company they can really, do you believe they willing to provide that kind of the code or some kind of the signals and they treat, treat to, or features of their, that attack to the government? Yeah, we can say yes, but sometimes they don't. That's a problem. And but government, government only allowed to do monitor some infrastructure of critical in, uh, network. They cannot access to whole things. I already mentioned about some kind of, say, uh, crypto, crypto ransom problem but uh, attackers are very smart enough to attack, focusing on not critical infrastructure. They attack very small company, but connected to the everything. That's a problem. That's why government cannot access to their, cannot monitor everything because it's, uh, they are not critical infrastructure. And then it's, it's a lot of, it's a, I, believe, I believe to cover that kind of roof hole, uh, they, uh, they sometimes uh, just suggest some encryption policy. Eh? Encryption policy is all not just device, or uh, not just network but about some device cases, but encryption policy is not the perfect solution because encryption policy sometimes, as you, as, you as you already see some FBI and FBI cases, and there's uh, sometimes encryption policy allow the government or ask, you, ask you IT company to do and the full access to every device, there's a problem, okay? I believe there's some kind of value conflict be between privacy protection and then protection of the cybersecurity problem. And then I believe it's the ISP liability of the whole network is not the perfect solution, I believe. Okay, it's my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would like to pass the ball to Michael and then to Nata. Two questions then, because we went from content monitoring to encryption debate. So can you briefly speak about these two debates on the young national level? And do you believe that both of them are related to cybersecurity? And if any of them does, how? How does it influence the agenda of your nation, on, on your national level? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, aren't we moving to a very well, interested, interesting uncharted territory? Uh, well, yeah, uh, coming, um, I just want to go further on what, what uh, my colleague said uh, about intermediary liability, how we handle these things. Um, uh, as uh, my association runs an internet uh, peering point, a very large one uh, in Germany and in many other countries, we were fighting the problem that Secret Service came in and uh, tapping lines. Um, no, not Bundestrojana, no, no, Secret Service tapping lines uh, um, to check. And so we went to court and we lost in the first instance uh, at court. 
um, but um, we knew that we were going to lose it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and we just did this uh, to step further on to the highest court and this is now pending and uh, we'll see uh, on what it comes out if Secret Service uh, the um, in, in Germany we have two uh, uh, two parts of Secret Service one for interior matters and then one for exterior matters and the one uh, who is in question here was the one for exterior matters, but it was interior, and he was also, when tapping lines, looking at uh, German nationals, which is not uh, the task of that uh, secret service. Um, well, uh, so we, we went to court, and we will see what, what will happen in the next years. Um, in, in principle, the um, ISP industry in Germany has no problem um, even not with uh, interception if it's signed off by a judge and uh, what we what the industry does not like is um, uh, preventive uh, uh, um, <coughs> interception just in case uh, because uh, we don't want the ISP industry according <coughs> to the laws you already mentioned Tatiana uh, uh, we, to see content uh, um, <coughs> and, and, and these things. According to fake news, uh, uh, fake news in, in the past it was sometimes called propaganda and it worked uh, <laughs> and still works today and uh, we, we don't address fake news uh, as uh, a threat in the cyber security area. Uh, we say, well, if people believe it, then they believe it. Uh, that was with newspapers ages ago as well. Uh, they read it and they could believe it or not, or could try. And today with the internet, you have much more sources uh, to check if it's really fake news or not. And this can, this can be uh, <coughs> needed. What encryption is, um, I think the current problem what, what we, are, we are seeing is, uh, in, uh, uh, especially for, um, <coughs> for the infrastructure problem, that you have many old embedded systems which you just hook up uh, on the net. Uh, they don't, uh, these systems don't understand any encryption so far. So it's a matter, <coughs> from my understanding, of time when these things are replaced or when the pressure of securing the uh, uh, infrastructure gets so high to, uh, to have them replaced. Um, <coughs> um, otherwise, uh, the uh, uh, liability on, on those vulnerable um, infrastructure. Um <coughs> and I, I, I fully agree when you said these uh, fake news and, and most of the stuff are according to media laws and, and to um, and, and this area. And with the media laws, we have our uh, separate meaning. Uh, the media industry, uh, uh, they forgot how to make business in the internet and they didn't come up uh, so far today to, uh, uh, to, to really uh, change their business models, or many of them. Uh, but it's getting better, it's getting improved now and uh, uh, they make more revenue, but still the, uh, the laws as they still exist are uh, to a different business model from, from the ages. So, um, and, and, the, and this is also why uh, those distributed um, <coughs> content from the media industry uh, may carry with it vulnerabilities and, 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 and um <coughs> making the, the system unsecure. Uh, thank you very much. I actually, I, I, I actually agree with um, Yon Chan Choi. Only, I mean, I agree with him that fake news are influencing cybersecurity debate, and I see it in Europe. I don't know about other regions, but as much as we want at Eurodig on the European level to treat them separately, they, you know, they just weasel, weasel their way, you know, here and there because they are related finally to the intermediary liabilities and content regulation. And I will pass the floor to Nata and to Adrian about um, their national initiatives and their take out on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. Yes, cyber uh, security is uh, 
influenced by fake news. But in our Georgian case, it is not the direct responsibility of cybersecurity authorities. Uh, uh, because, uh, like in German uh, case, ISPs can, uh, can uh, take down the content if it is illegal said by judge, if we have a court order for that and not based on somebody's perception and not based on the monitoring of the system. So monitoring and preventive monitoring of a uh, um, network is not responsibility and it's not a good practice that is encouraged in Georgia. Considering our geopolitical situation, fake news uh, and propaganda played a big role in uh, political decision-making process. And for that, uh, our ministries have uh, STRATCOM divisions, strategic communication divisions, and fake news and how to have state response to fake news is adhered by those divisions. I mean, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Justice, and what they are doing, they, their response is giving the proper information to public and not censorship, not taking down the content, but giving the proper and uh, valuable and right information to, to the information society. This is the current process. And we are uh, taking, uh, looking at uh, fake news as the part of the hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. This is uh, right now. Um, can I ask the question, so if you use the word warfare are you relating it to cyber attacks or to war or to both because i know that this the security debate and now it is just moving more to illegal content than to security so uh, do you think that they should stay separated or it's it just natural process or uh, it's very difficult to uh, just combine cyber in every kind of uh, conflict, but we are uh, having these words together when we have armed conflict and together with armed conflict we have uh, like information, uh, fake information sharing um, uh, situations. And this was what happened in Ukraine and what is happening in Georgia right now. Then together with the kinetic attacks we have propaganda and this is hybrid in, mm -hmm. uh, in all terms together. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Adrian, what, what, what can you say about all this discussion from your national perspective? Thank you. Uh, I see some similarities between the fake news debate and the cybersecurity debate uh, in that regard that uh, um, it is all transmitted data and uh, with uh, fake news it becomes content so people see it and they uh, get upset about it. So they call for someone needs to do something about it. And therefrom comes the discussion about responsibility or even liability of intermedia intermediaries. Uh, in the cybersecurity realm, you don't necessarily see the malicious data or the data that does harm in some way. So therefore, the intermediaries, they, they are able to, to see several things and I'd like to call upon the intermediaries to take reasonable steps to identify and mitigate cybersecurity issues like botnets or phishing, uh, because if they wait until you have the court order, the attack is already mm -hmm. through, or the, the, the virus has spread even further. So therefore, we believe that uh, the intermediaries uh, have a vital role to play in securing the whole ecosystem. That, that, that being said, it is not up to the intermediaries alone. So everyone, all the users and also regulators, everyone needs to, uh, to, to work together to, to secure the, the internet ecosystem. Okay, uh, thanks for your opinion. I, but I believe they don't need some court, court, court decision because, uh, because uh, we can, we can uh, divide uh, f how fake news disseminate all over the world. First of all, the who provided, uh, who produced it, and then uh, who disseminated it, and third, who keep saying this. It's the third one is the ISP, maybe. But the way, when it comes to producer, we can, according to the MIT research uh, project, the producer of the fake news currently is much more human than bot. But if, if it's the human, we cannot find it because they are anonymous. But uh, when it comes to social bot, Somebody, someone who can find this, who is going, who is doing, who, who is, a, is an intermediary. For example, Facebook, 
Facebook definitely find who is your, who is a, who is tapped to the bot to the platform and the, how they manipulate it, and then it's, and also Twitter also find who is the who is the who is using the bot connected to their platform. That, that's why I'm asking. When it comes to the production of face, fake news, we can we can find the anonymous people, but we can the ISP intermediaries can find who is using the bot to the platform. Okay. So am I right, uh, head of the moderator, am I right that what you're saying is that um, it is not about content monitoring, it's about ISP's uh, uh, responsibility to help with the identification of, the, of who is behind this, but not what is wrong and what is right. Okay, this is, this is a very important clarification because I also see here the intersection with the cybersecurity because if you are using automation tools, you can use them for attacks, you can use them and, and yeah. That, that's why, uh, that's why uh, internet media do not need to judge the wise contents is okay they just find out who is the manipulator over much more over volume and then they detect it and just struck down not the need of cut order uh, yes. uh, thank you very much for the clarification because i believe it is important in in the realm of national debate and we have only 10 minutes left and are there any questions from you before i will ask uh, the speakers to wrap it up so, seeing no hands, I would like to ask the general question. How do you think, uh, just name me one challenge your regional or national initiative would see in the next year for cybersecurity on your national debate? And secondly, uh, how do you see your national initiative contributing to the cybersecurity on the national level? Do you contribute or do you just discuss so, two questions. Challenge and your contribution. Uh, and I will start with Korean IGF, and we go this way. What's Korean day on country? Not uh, me. Sorry? Okay, uh, okay I, I just try to uh, suggest a plural oh, okay. to raise a hand about, to question about what's the critical problem with cybersecurity in your own country. That's, uh, that's a big. Okay, let's do this. Is there any floor? Okay. You please identify your country and name, please. Uh, yeah, I'm from Colombia. My name is Alvaro. And well, I, I think one major issue about fake news, in especially in my country, is that they are displayed as if they were true. So these people that make fake news, they try to make the image of the of the information similar to one of a newspaper's uh, web platform. So I think there's an issue, uh, there's an issue about how these um, fake news are being displayed. So I think a, a good initiative would be to uh, difference, or uh, to teach people how to difference between how people, uh, how does uh, um, an authentic news is and not because and not that it is true just because it looks like it is true uh, thank you i'm moses Hoboy from south africa um i just wanted to find out how do you mitigate um fake news from spreading um i would also like to link it to the, the, the current U.S. elections where um, information, wrong information basically, was given to voters and they went to uh, wrong polling stations uh, during the elections. How do you mitigate that? Um, so, one caveat here. Uh, it is the session on the national and regional cybersecurity initiatives. Unfortunately, we do not have anyone from the U.S. here, first of all. And secondly, I do believe that my take out from the discussion we had is that while fake news in the realm of cybersecurity can be fought with some of the tools that are used to fought automation, for example, or, or identify who is behind the attack or behind the news. It is more of a social problem that has to be tackled with different tools. 
And so um, going to particular case, I, I believe that for this panel it would be a bit more going to the weeds and, and, and a bit more politicized that we, we would like to see this panel. We, we are messengers. Yes, please. I don't know. You hear? Okay. Uh, I'm Evo Shrego. I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I'm a member of MAG. Speaking about cybersecurity, I would just mention one uh, recent example. Our web page uh, for IGF uh, 2018 is now under attack, and we have no access to it. And it's uh, for, for quite a while uh, unaccessible to uh, us, and uh, uh, we have no, no, no information. And even though it's, I mean, the design and the, all this interactive uh, uh, program, it's really very good uh, in concept, but uh, we have no use of it. So we have all these people in the room just because they got lost and came here just by chance because the website is not... <laughs> no, since, no, I'm just since joking. Since this morning, sorry, you know, Bella. it was... Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, an irony that uh, on IGF uh, forum uh, and talking about cybersecurity, we have such... Uh, a serious failure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have one intervention from here. Uh, hi, I'm Ana Ivy from Mexico. Uh, I'm also an ISOC ambassador, an ISOC ambassador program. Now, since last year, we were working in the implementation of our national strategy, cybersecurity strategy. I'm working, I'm academic, but working with the government. We have this multi stakeholder approach from the cybersecurity strategy. I want to know. How are you sharing information, strategic information about critical infrastructure, uh, cyber attacks or incidents, and how the, uh, the ISP can share information too with government? Because sometimes the private sector don't want to share because they have these reputational prog problems or maybe even the government don't want to share information. So if you can share with us their experience in this case. Uh, thank you very much. And as we have five minutes left, each speaker has one minute, and this probably would be the last question. So you, whatever you want to say, you say. Nata, starting with you. From a Georgian case, we have for that computer emergency response team, who is a very trusted partner for the uh, private sector, and we have non-disclosure agreements sometimes that we uh, provide uh, data to other agencies without uh, telling that this bank is attack, but general about what kind of attack is that, and provide general information with the tips to, the, uh, to that sector as well as to the others. So CERT in our case is a trusted partner for uh, private sector. It's uh, very similar in Switzerland. We also have the, a governmental entity that works as a, a facilitator for the information sharing amongst uh, the operators of critical infrastructure. Uh, we do this in a, the form of a public-private partnership, and nothing is mandatory in that realm. So everyone, uh, well, we needed to build trust over the years so that uh, private entities share the information with us and amongst themselves. And also we try to provide them with the, the threat landscape so that they know what, what to expect in the, um, in the future. Um, we also have a governmental entity. Um, it was um, responsible in former times for the governmental infrastructure only, and now it expands together with um, uh, industry and uh, all the other stakeholders to deal with these issues and we also have a law where companies have to report within a given time any incidents uh, uh, to those. Um, s some of them try to uh, circumvent uh, but I think it's only a question of time because every, it can hit everyone as we see on the example of the web page here. In case of South Korea, uh, the government uh, acquire many of the uh, loophole or some um, cyber, cyber attack information from the gray market and, to the, and distribute it to the industry. But there's not much case in, in the other way around because, uh, because industry is much more reluctant because uh, why? They, they sometimes they can re uh, re reveal their top, top secret or uh, some business uh, 
secret something, uh, know how, they, that's why they will only link to do this. But uh, I'm not from the United States, but the U.S. passed the law about Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. There's two important features in there. First thing is that uh, they have uh, some non-disclosure policy, and uh, uh, even though they know it, something, each other, but they do not identify who, who acquired this, who attacked, who has been attacked by this. And second thing is that even though they uh, release the information about the cyber attack, they not they free from the law, law liability. That, that means even though they share the information, nobody can sue them. That's a big, big question. And a uh, very big advancement. And, the, and then uh, tomorrow has a, we have a fake news session at NRI, okay? Please come here again. <laughs> I'm a moderator. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And we are just in time to finish. The, I'm, I'm sorry, I saw the hand over there, but we have to free the room. So could you please, please give a big applause to our impromptu speakers and to our invited speakers. Thank you all so very much for making this session interesting and full of content. Thank you.